Hello, everyone, and welcome today to the Zone 7 Gardening Virtual Plant Clinic. Today's topic is Celebrate Native Trees for Fall Color, and we're going to be focusing on sassafras and sourwood. My name is Linda, your host for today's Zone 7 Gardening presentation. The photo on the left is of sassafras, and the photo on the right is of sourwood. What gorgeous fall colors. The Zone 7 Gardening Virtual Plant Clinic series highlight native and other plants suited to grow well in our Mid-Atlantic USDA Hardiness Zone 7 Gardens. These series of clinics are sponsored by the Virginia Cooperative Extension Program of Virginia's two land-grant universities, Virginia Tech and Virginia State University. Staffing our plant clinics are master gardeners from the Fairfax County Master Gardeners. Gopal will share with us what is currently blooming in our Zone 7 gardens. Stone crop, an, an attractive perennial for a sunny cottage garden or rock garden. Over to you, Gopal. Thank you, Linda. I'll be talking about stone crop. And there are wide varieties of stone crop, but the specific one that I'll be talking about, they all line the genus Hylotelephium. They used to be under the uh, genus Sedum, but recently they have been recategorized under Hylotelephium. What are stone crops? Uh, they are perennial herbaceous succulents and they are found across temperate North America, Europe, and Asia. These are rather small plants between 18 to 24 inches in height. As you can see in the picture, they are erect plants. They grow in clusters. They have soft stems and thick green fleshy leaves, hence the name succulent. Uh, the dense, huge inflorescence bloom late in summer or early fall, and you can see them blooming right now as well. They resemble broccoli, like the heads of broccoli, and they start out green, as you can see some of those in the uh, center of the picture, but soon they become white, pink, purple, or red, depending upon the variety. Stone crop, they thrive in the zones of four to nine. They're hardy in these zones, means they will grow their perennials, so they'll grow on their on the next season. They are easy to grow in ground as well as in pots. They do love full sun. And while they can be grown in shade, they tend to become floppy, especially when the inflorescence starts blooming, they become rather heavy and they, become, they open up and become floppy. They are heat and drought tolerant when fully established. And the recommended way to water them is the soak and dry watering, where you soak them really well, the ground becomes wet, and then you let the ground completely dry out before watering them again. They do really well in uh, sandy um, and shallow soils. It can be clay too, but it needs to be really well drained because if there's too much water standing around the roots, it will cause root rot. They do not ha have any specific nutrition requirement. They do well in nutrient poor soil. And if at all you have to fertilize, it should be done in spring. Composting is one of the best ways to grow these plants and provide them fertilizer. In winter, the plants do uh, dry up. And while some people choose to leave them, the, the brown stems and the inflorescence, the dried up inflorescence, these can easily be pruned to give a clean look. The Chelsea chop method can be used in which uh, the top one third to half of most of the stems is removed. That method can be used to grow a more bushier and erect plant and the cluster will not flop over a Chelsea chop. About the cycle and different ways of propagation, the deciduous foliage does dry back in winter and can be removed. But at the base of those stems, the roots produce new plants in spring. They do propagate very easily by division, which is like, as you can see in the stems, that's in spring, you can separate out some of the stems along with parts of the root. And that's the easiest way of propagating them. But stem or leaf or seed-based uh, propagation can also be used, just that they do take longer. Division is best in spring after the chance of frost has passed. 
Uh, growing in pots may require additional care because they do tend to overgrow in pots. So we need to repot them after every few years. And we need to control how often we water these plants. And if, it, if the pot is in an exposed place, we need to shelter them so that they do not have repeat freezing and thawing cycles, which can be achieved by using composting, wrapping, or mulching. There are no major maintenance requirements because these plants tend to stay small, uh, 18 to 24 inches, and because the soft stems dry up and the entire plant almost disappears if you choose to prune them. So they do not need major maintenance. However, the inflorescence that we talked about looking like a broccoli, that may be heavy and may cause the plants to open up, especially for plants that are growing in the shade. This may also happen in the, if there are storms or heavy rains, and this can be reduced to some extent by using the Chelsea chop method of pruning. Bed soils do cause root rot, as in most of the other plants. And while it's not common, but slugs, uh, aphids, etc., may damage the plants. Putting the plants, growing the plants in pots does help reduce some of these issues above, but the pots do require additional care. And like we discussed, they need to be sheltered in winter. They may be deer and rabbit resistant. In my yard, I've not had those problems, but you know, given a chance and the need, deer would attack them as well. Uh, what are the benefits of stone crop? These plants are beautiful in landscaping. They can be brought indoors as well as ornamental house plants, both growing in pots as well as cut foliage and uh, cut blooms. Even the dried ones can be left either standing in the, uh, the bed or they can be cut and uh, used for decoration indoors. They are attractive to bees butterflies and different pollinators, as well as songbirds. The young stem and leaves of these plants are not very toxic. They may be edible and they do, do have undesirable taste. They are also called life everlasting because they can easily regenerate and they stay fresh. Even the cut ones stay fresh for a very long time. One of the interesting things that I used to Dry when I was a kid was growing these plants from the leaves. A lot of plants grow from the leaf itself. And that was really interesting to observe. And it's, it's, it's a nice pastime for the kids. Landscaping and companion plants. These are often planted in small groups in rock gardens along with other types of sedums, other succulents. They can serve as accents or as borders or as individual specimens in clusters. They do provide a low maintenance, low water and low fertilizer requiring perennial. So which means that with very little care or no care at all, they provide good ground cover as well as a nice color to your yard. Other companion plants include like the ones that have similar sun, heat and water requirements, namely coneflowers, rudbeckias, asters, etc. The word stone crop itself refers to their growing wild on rocky or stony ledges, and that's why you often find them in uh, rock gardens or in sandy places. Here are some varieties of stone crop. The one that you see on the left, it's called sedum autumn charm laos, and it's a variegated type of the sedum autumn choy. It has green and white leaves as can be seen on the left. The uh, bottom picture is of sedum chocolate cherry and there's a similar one called chocolate drop. And these are dark leaved cultivars of the plants. The one on the top right is one of the commonest ones. It's called autumn joy stone crop. And it's, uh, it's a hardy sturdy a variety with light green leaves and deep rose flowers. This is one of the commonest ones and the ones that you find in most yards. There are many other varieties with interesting colors like beach party, birdie party, etc. And you can look those up online. They are available mostly for sale in the big uh, stores. Here are some of the references that I used. Most of those were from the North Carolina extension gardener plant 
uh, toolbox. And uh, again, Missouri Botanical Garden had some great references there as well. And uh, Washington State University, the varieties that I uh, posted are available on gardenia.net. Thank you, thank you very much. And Linda, back to you. Thank you, Gopal. And like you said, they're really easy to grow from leaves and they just sprout right up. So there's so many varieties, there's no maintenance, no serious disease or pest issues. They're loved by bees, butterflies, and songbirds, as you said, and a great choice for our Zone 7 gardens. So thank you very much for sharing today. Sonia, let's turn to our next topic, native trees for fall color with Sonia and she'll be talking to us about sassafras. Hi, I'm Sonia Berdia here talking to you about the sassafras tree, sassafras tree which is a quite an interesting tree. It's native. It's native to the entire east coast of the United States. It's interesting. It's a deciduous tree and it's also dioecious which means that a tree is individually tree that has female flowers or male flowers. So that means that if you wanna have pollinated flowers and fruit, you need to have a male tree that has the male flowers near the nearby. The tree gets from 30 to 60 feet tall and 25 to 40 feet wide. And it's interesting to note that it tends in the wild to grow in thickets. So there will be some little trees that grow out of the roots of a tree. So it makes the thicket. The blooms in the early to mid spring, they like sun to part shade and prefer moist, acidic, well-drained soil. And the fall foliage is pretty spectacular. It, the colors on the same tree can range from orange to purple. As I said, with the distinct, distinguishing features, I, there's a picture here of the tree in the spring. And then the flower, the pollinated female flowering plants bear small purple fruits. It's funny, it's a funny character because this tree has three distinct leaf shapes and that occurs all on the same tree. So in this picture down to the right, you can see that there's the, the most of the leaves in this picture show the trident shaped leaves that has three lobes. Then there's the, the leaves that have just the one lobe and then they have the mitten shaped leaves. There's one on the, right around 10 o'clock in the picture, that's the mitten shaped leaves. So it's kind of funny that way. It's like, it's having a identity crisis. <laughs> so this is interesting, it, it, this is historical. It's historical that sassafras leaves were dried and ground into uh, this po this powder called fillet powder, which was used in Creole seasoning and in gumbo, and also that the oil of the sassafras is, is, was extracted from the bark of the tree roots and used in fragrances and flavorings, including in sassafras root beer, and also used in tonics. But now the it, sassafras is considered carcinogenic, so it's no longer used. It's, very, it's fairly recent in the past few years that it's been, it's been considered a carcinogenic product. So you'll no longer find the, the root beer or the filet seasoning. And I certainly hope you don't go out and try to make tea out of the leaves. And again, sassafras, it forms a thicket from the suckers. So here's a, a picture of the berries, which I find quite beautiful. So the benefits to wildlife, the fruits, are eaten by all sorts of birds, wild turkeys, de deer, and bears. And the leaves are a, are a food source to a couple different kinds of caterpillars, the spice bush swallowtail and the tiger swallowtail. Leaves and twigs are a food source for bears, woodchucks, deer, and rabbits. The rabbits also eat the bark in the winter. And so the thickets are home to many creatures and insects. It's a very protected area. So if you're thinking about planting sassafras in your yard, you have to think about where in your yard you want it. If you wanna have it in like a showy front part of your yard and you wanna have it as a tree shape, then you have to be careful to 
cut all the suckers down. And that's pretty much the kind of, of pruning that you'd have to do. If you wanted to have it in the back of, you know, maybe a garden bed, you can leave it as a thicket. And in fact, that's going to be a better protection for the native little creatures. So it's sort of up to you how you prefer your garden to look. Propagation is difficult because the sassafras tree has a deep tap taproot. Trees are typically started by seeds, sometimes by uh, cuttings from the roots. And it's, it's easiest to purchase the trees from a garden center that sells native plants. As I said, pruning of the tree is unnecessary, except that you have to cut off the suckers from, from the ground if you, if you want a tree shaped like a tree as opposed to a thicket. And that's it. Here are my references. Sonia, are there any references that you'd like to point out to the folks online? You know, the one Nancy Rose through the seasons with sassafras is a nicely written reference. So I would say that one. All right, great. Well, thank you very much, Sonia. What a gorgeous tree for uh, fall colors with those three distinct leaves, the lobate, mitten, and those three lobes that you pointed out all on the same tree. Wow, that, that's pretty unique. Plus all the benefits to wildlife and I guess not so much to people anymore. So, but thanks for sharing. Let's turn to part two of our native trees. This is part two of our native trees for fall color. And I'll be speaking on oxydendrum arboreum, a tree for all seasons. Let's do a quick review of some of the common names. If there's sourwood, sour gum, lily of the valley tree, arrowwood, elk tree, sorrow tree, and tiki tree. So to, are just a few of the common names. The genus name comes from the Greek word oxy, meaning acid, and dendron, meaning tree. The foliage is bitter, hence the accepted common name, sourwood. But the photo on the right is was taken in Green Springs Garden in Alexandria, Virginia. You can find it in the native tree garden. It's smallish, off to the side. Nevertheless, the succinct and rare tree is filled with character and grace, bringing interest and value to each of the seasons. Sourwood is a small to medium-sized deciduous understory tree and the only member of its genus, which is rare. It's native, endemic to North America. In our zone seven region, it grows 20 to 30 feet with a spread of 20 feet. It grows in and along the coastal plain naturally and as cultivated in our region. In the upland forest and mountainous areas, sourwood is quite adaptable to growing in the rocky areas and ridges. Under these conditions, it sometimes reaches up to 60 feet, developing small forest communities of sourwood within the gr greater forest. There it grows compatibly with the oak, the hickory, and the pine. Given other circumstances, it seems to grow well in areas recently cleared where it doesn't have to compete with other plants in the open fields and along the highways. Its shape is roughly pyramidic and round top. The bark, as you can see on the photo on the right, is rough and deeply fissured with brown streaks. You can see the streaks right through there. For the most part, sourwood likes slightly acid soil the pH of 5 to 6.5. It grows an array of soil types from loamy to slightly sandy and even gravelly. It thrives best in moist but well-drained conditions with full to part sun and tolerates some drought. 
The growth habits and patterns are driven by its root system. Sourwood starts with a tap root, similar to what Sonia mentioned about sassafras, but it develops a fibrous and deep system of roots, which spreads extensively. This often makes it difficult to transplant successfully. In springtime, bright green glossy leaves develop with the pale spitlets from the small fragrant bell-shaped flowers emerge. Thus, another common name, lily of the valley tree, as you can see in this photo. The flowers grow at the end of the stems, gracefully trending downward as lacy panicles on the foliage. From June to July, the leaves become a deep green and dense. The leaves are ovate, six to eight inches long, and commonly finely toothed, and have a sour, bitter taste, hence the common name sourwood. As the flowers mature, bees, wasps, butterflies, and moths are drawn to the sweet nectar of the flowers. Eventually, the fruit of the panicles develop and ripen each flower containing a seed capsule. As fall approaches, sourwood produces an early lingering display of brilliant color, red, yellow, orange, purple, sometimes even on the same tree, depending on the cultivar. Eventually, the panicles become, begin to dry, looking a bit like ghostly fingers, gently rattling in the breeze. In winter, though, the leaves are gone, the panicles persist drying to a pale gray. As the season progresses, the seed capsule collapse and split open and burst, sending the seeds to the surrounding leaf litter. When the winter gives way to spring and you have the right conditions, new sourwood shoots appear. Sourwood makes a good specimen tree in a residential garden. It pairs well with the colors and textures of pine, magnolia, and other leafy evergreens. It stands out in a carefully chosen spot in a front of a woody area. Some desirable cultivars include Albug margentum, which has white leaf margins plus white marbling on most leaves. Chameleon has colorful foliage display that displays shades of red, purple, yellow in the fall and has an upright habit. Mount Charm provides early fall color foliage and bright shades and the habit is symmetrical. It should be noted that it is sometimes difficult to grow in our part of zone seven. It is naturally not a long lived tree, perhaps 70 years. And then over the years, it seems to be vulnerable to persistent antibiotic environmental stress, to seasonal passing of webworms, fungi, moths, and even some grazing of the deer. Though so all these factors are either manageable or will pass, we are additionally experiencing the effects of climate change, which becomes another stressor for this tree. Recently, there is some concern for the general viability of this rare tree. Given the impact of climate change, it may be harder to sustain growth. It is difficult, but not impossible, to find sourwood growing in the natural setting in our part of Zone 7. However, in a recent article from the Fairfax Gardening website, written by Gretchen Spencer, she notes that discovery of three mature sourwood specimens growing along the George Washington Memorial Parkway south of Alexandria. What a hopeful sign. Others may be found at Meadowlark Gardens in Vienna, Virginia, and one at Green Springs Garden in Alexandria, Virginia. That was on my first photo. Sourwood is propagated by seed and peat moss which can be purchased quite inexpensively or a young plant that can be found at a nursery, nursery specializing in native plants. These young sourwoods can be purchased in a market pot or loose, loosely bagged root ball. 
selection of the appropriate site in line with the requirements and conditions is important. In any case, before planning, it's important that the roots are loosely and widely arranged with any circular roots trimmed out before planting. When the tree begins to grow, you can prune it to select a single trunk and a desired shape. Gen generally, pruning is best done in March through July. Dead or diseased wood can be pruned out at any time. A nitrogen-based fertilizer may be given at any event at any uh, an advantage at any point. Sourwood has been rare valued tree for millennia. Native peoples understood its value for multiple medical uses, making leaf infusions as tea, the sap, the gum, and the inner bark for rashes and sores. Practical products of sour wood include wooden tool handles, pipe stems, arrows. Colonial people learned to use sour wood for array of medical uses as well. They also use them as butter paddles and sled runners. Sour wood was also used in producing a spring tonic. Sour wood whiskey, was used for men's health issues, heart problems, and more. Currently though, sour wood is produced and highly praised and valued for its extraordinary flavor on uh, sour wood honey. It's produced from the sour wood tea, trees in the forests of central Appalachia, West Virginia, and Virginia, and can be purchased locally. And all this is a fascinating native and it's well worth nurturing, preserving, and sustaining. Here are Mary Ellen's references. And the picture on the right, you can see the panicles as they appear in the fall. Let's uh, go to questions submitted during registration. Teresa asks, what do I need to know to transplant sassafras? grass seedlings and Sonia's going to answer that. So as I mentioned in the in the conversation we had earlier, they're tricky trees to transplant and to propagate. They ideally are propagated from seeds and or some cuttings from the roots. The seeds have to go through a stratification process, which means essentially it needs to go through a cold period as if it were outside on the ground during the winter. So you can do, you can actually put seeds in the refrigerator to mimic that. The best way to get a sassafras seedling is to actually buy one at a garden center that specializes in native plants. I don't know if at the garden center, you can actually buy specifically a male one or female one if they've been sexed or not. And then transplanting the seedling is probably very similar to any other tree where you dig a hole twice the size of the container and then backfill with, with a mixture of some organic material, compost or leaf grow or whatever in the, in the soil that's there. When you place the tree in the hole, you want to make sure that the crown of the roots, like the very beginning of where the roots come out, are at our level with the soil so that you don't over cover the part of the tree's trunk with soil. Another thing is, you know, you, when you mulch around the tree, you don't want to have the mulch up against the bark of the soil. You want to have a, a little ring around the bark so that there's no way that bugs can get in there and cause some damage. Thank you, Sonia. What great gardening advice. We also have a question from the chat about sassafras. Uh, Peter asks, he, he has a thicket of sassafras in his backyard, and he thinks that all of the trees are from one main trunk, as you described, Sonia, in your uh, presentation, And but he has never seen any fruit. And so he's questioning whether he needs to find a male tree and plant that in the thicket to get fruit, or do you have any guidance about what might be going on about getting fruit for his sassafras? Well, I think he's, I mean, I, I think that he's probably right that all the trees are from one 
it's if he has a thicket, it's likely that all the trees in that thicket are either female or male. So perhaps the best way to go would be in the spring when it's flowering to take a cutting of the flowers and go to a garden center and try to figure out he might have a female tree, but he might have a male tree. So perhaps if he goes to a garden center with a cutting, he could get a tree that has flower, the opposite sex flowers. Probably that would be the best way to go. It might be that he has nail thicket, in which case he wouldn't get fruit from it, but perhaps he could plant a female tree. You know, it's just hard to say what, what he has. Right. And so you mentioned that it was difficult to sex this tree. So having some advice from a uh, the Virginia Cooperative Extension, we have a plant clinic that can help diagnostic lab that can help identify male versus female trees or from a garden center. That's great advice. The diagnostic lab is still open now, but I think that Sonia's the recommendation about getting a flower for identifying the tree is important. So that would be a springtime activity. In spring, we usually open the diagnostic lab in May. However, if they flower before that, we can send it to our cooperative extension agent and we'll get it diagnosed at that time. Go to fairfaxgardening.org under programs is the diagnostic lab, and you can find the forms for the diagnostic lab. Thanks for all that great advice, Sonia and and Anne. Thank you very much. So we got a second question that was submitted during registration. Aaron asked, where can I find sourwood seedlings or what is the best way to propagate them? So just a little bit of background on the conditions for, for growing sourwood again. Sourwood grows best in moist, well-drained, acidic soils in full to light shade. For best fall color, trees should be planted in the full sun. The trees are slow growing and sensitive to air pollution, poor drainage, root disturbance, and soil compaction. The sourwood has a deep fibrous root system and has a reputation for being difficult to transplant or move. It is best grown from a small container grown plants found at nurseries specializing in native plants. And before planting, it's important that the roots are loosely and widely arranged with any circular roots trimmed out before planting. Or you can propagate by fresh seed in moist peat moss. The problem is I'm not sure if seeds are available from uh, nurseries specializing in uh, native plants, but you'd have to look online. Mary Ellen has informed me that there is some seeds available for low cost, she said, but you'd have to do your, your research there. So I would recommend going to a reliable nursery that specializes in native plants and, and looking for a small container of a tree to transplant. And another place to, to find reliable websites, you could check out the Virginia Native Plant Society. They have a listing of local nurseries. And you can also check out Plant Nova Natives too for more information on the sourwood trees. Okay, so here's a few tips. Dig and divide or plant new perennials by 15 October to allow time for the plants to root in well before winter. So get well established. Plant spring bulbs among hostas, ferns, daylilies, or ground covers as these plants grow in the spring and they will hide the dying bulb foliage. Cannas, Dahlias can be dug when the frost nips their foliage. Allow the plants to dry under cover in an airy frost-free place before storage. And persimmons start to ripen, especially after the first frost. And a reminder here in zone 7A, our first fall frost is typically between 15 October and 25 October. 
and zone 7B, it's 25 October to 5 November. And you can also check out two weeks ago, we had a zone 7 plant clinic on persimmons and pawpaws. So you can um, go to our YouTube site and, and check out the presentation there. Another thing to do in October is place guards around the trunks of young fruit trees for protection against mice and rabbits. Plant cool season grasses by 15 October. There's a theme here, I think, 15 October. Fertilize September through November for the cool season grasses to promote good root growth and apply herbicides to non-seeded areas to kill the cool season broadleaf weeds such as dandelion and chickweed. And my source is Missouri Botanical Gardens. They have all kinds of great information for tips and diseases to look up monthly and also bloom times monthly as well. Fairfax Master Gardener's website, you can subscribe by email to receive notices when our site is updated. You can follow us on Instagram and look for gardening advice. For even more information, check out our YouTube site. Thank you for joining us.